Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. Hello everybody, welcome to Elite Wine TV. I'm your host, Mark Fusco, here for a Google Hangout on air, live, whatever. I don't know, I'm looking down here at the laptop, looking right there in the camera. Looks pretty good on here. Um, I don't know who, who's watching yet, nobody's watching yet, so we're going to uh, we're going to kind of do some little, little bit of housekeeping here while we're uh, kind of waiting for a few people to start watching. Now, I think there's a way for me to, like, actually do some stuff here, but let's get the chat screen up. There we go. And then a few other things. All right. So, um, it's Cabernet day, April, April, August, uh, 28th. What is it? 28th? It's my day off. I don't have to worry about what date it is. August 28th, 2014. We're sitting on the couch today. We're going to enjoy some, uh, enjoy some, uh, Cabernet Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon uh, for Cabernet Day. Um, assuming that I got this history right, uh, Cabernet Day was founded five years ago by Mr. Rick Bacchus. Is it Bacchus or Bacchus? I don't know. I've met him. You're going to have to tell me which one when you see this. Um, but anyway, he started this up. Now, there's a lot of confusion about this day. So you'll Google. Go ahead. Google Cabernet Day. Oh, I'll, I'll wait. Did you do it yet? Just Google it. Just call, tell Siri, Google Cabernet Day, or what is Cabernet Day? If you do, it says, Cap, Siri says Cabernet, by the way. Found that out today. Um, so Cabernet Day, if you Google it, there's a lot of confusion as to when it is. Um, you'll see there's a, there's a web page that says Cabernet Day is always on the 30th of August. Um, it also says that Merlot Day is always on November 7th. Um, but, you know, if, since I know that Rick started this and I saw the tweet and it says Cabernet Day is, you know, today, you know, has a picture and everything with a date, kind of go with, with him instead of like some random website that nobody knows about. But then there was also August 29th was being Cabernet Day. I know there's restaurants doing it on various days this week, uh, tying in Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, they're using Cabernet Sauvignon too because they, I think people forget that Cabernet Franc is Cabernet Sauvignon's dad or mom. I don't know which one, but his his Cabernet Franc is the parentage of uh, Cabernet Sauvignon, and um, so I think some of these restaurants are forgetting that. But uh, anyway, um, he started this a few years ago to kind of you know just have a day on social media. People get together, they're tweeting about it on Facebook, and there was a Google Hangout a couple years ago on it. Uh, I know I did something afterwards. So um, so anyway. I'm going ahead and, you know, hopping in on this, and uh, it didn't look like anyone was doing a Google Hangout this year, so I thought I'd put one together on the fly. Now, um, all you people who said you are going to watch, all 11 of you, I don't see you on my screen here saying viewing. That's okay, because this is an episode of 1337 Wine of Elite Wine TV anyways. Um <laughs> So let's talk about Cabernet Sauvignon first. So Cabernet Sauvignon, like I've already mentioned. Oh, by the way, I got the Vikings hat going. This is a uh, last day of preseason football. Um, not that I, not that I would be able to watch the Vikings on any regular channel, but 
once this thing is over, we're gonna we're gonna find the uh, we're gonna find the uh, bootleg stream and stream it to the Apple TV. All right, because um, that's how I watch Vikings football. Anyway, um, so uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. Now that is, uh, like I said, derived from or uh, it came out of Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. Had a little fun in the vineyard one day and produced Cabernet Sauvignon. Now, for a long time, nobody really thought of that. I mean, they just kind of figured it was a grape that just, you know, came about. And, you know, they, they argued and they tried to figure out and, you know, what the parentage. And blah, blah, blah. Who knew? It was actually in the name. Actually, the name, for once, told you where the grape came from instead of all these wild and crazy theories that, that happened over the centuries. It actually was Cabernet Franc and Sauvignon Blanc. And when you taste Cabernet Sauvignon, you also can get some of the similar characteristics of both grapes. I almost thought I had a Sauvignon Blanc on here just to mess with things, but I didn't. Um, all right, so um, so that's what the history of Cabernet Sauvignon is really. I mean, there's not much else to tell you. I mean, I mean we can go through each area of the world and how it grows, but it's like Chardonnay. It pretty much grows everywhere. Um Almost every country that makes wine makes a cab, pretty much. Um, they may not be known for it, um, and you may have uh, it may not be part of its official um, appellation system. So, like you know, like places like Italy, it's it's not that you can't find one you can, but it's going to be called an IGT or IGP. I think as of this year or whatever, they changed it, all the regulations. Same idea. It's, it's not a DOC or DOCG. Um, so you're going to find it in the old world. You're going to find it, of course, in the new world where almost nobody has any kind of um, uh, restrictions on the grapes that you have to grow in a certain area. That's kind of interesting between old world and new world where old world, a lot of times they, they specify the grapes and they'll specify acreage, not acreage, but tons per acre, though how many um how much uh, uh aging you have to have what kind of wood you have to use all kinds of stuff in the new world man it's anything goes so um that's a big difference between the two um wines that i chose for today now um of course earlier this week on sunday like what three in the morning local time uh there was a six 6.0 or 6.1 magnitude earthquake depending on which story you're reading and what, what was the latest and greatest update to it um and uh this kind of is annoying me on the camera there oh hi you didn't we're supposed to see that <laughs> that was kind of neat anyway you know what? i probably should have left it the other way because now i got all the lines that's okay i'm not supposed to be looking at the little thing over there um so the earthquake so we had an earthquake in napa valley and it was in the southern part of Napa Valley, and uh, that was uh, American Canyon. I just got to make sure. Because, and that was actually a city, by the way. It's not, it is not a, uh, a valley. I mean, there's a valley, but um, it was actually in uh, the city. And you also had um, uh, a lot of damage in the Napa town itself. Uh, American Canyons, making sure I had it right. So, um, and it happened early in the morning. Where's my thing? There it is. Um, and uh, it was lucky that it was early in the morning based upon all the uh, accounts because you didn't have a lot of people out working, especially when we're talking about all the barrels that fell to the ground and cases of wine and all these things in warehouses and in wineries uh, in a and businesses so the fact that it happened in the morning most of the people were in their homes um where there's less likely of a chance of injury or death so it, it was beneficial that it happened that early in the morning um i'm sure people weren't happy about waking up in the middle of the night but i think they'd rather have that than have a barrel of wine fall on their head and there were a few wineries not a whole lot of wineries basically because where it was at in the southern part of napa valley um the uh the epicenter being there while the valley felt it the the main impact was in an area that didn't have a lot of wineries from what i've read okay and I, even just looking at the napa valley map of uh, what wineries are around there there aren't a lot of wineries down there they're all in the northern part more northern part of napa valley um 
So, but you did have a few um, wineries that that were affected. Now, in looking at, um, and there isn't some master list on Google or on the internet that I could find. I had to kind of piece together from different um, uh, web sources the wineries that uh, were affected. Um, Man, all, oh, yeah, and all these Google Plus things happening. All right, so um, what wineries were affected by um, by it? So the list that I've come up with is Etude, Hess, we have one of their wines, Silver Oak, Fontenelle Family, Trefethen, uh, Signorello, uh, Lagier Meredith, and Bouchain Vineyard. Now, there are some wineries that were near the episode not affected or affected very little. So this is kind of Kind of interesting. Uh, Cuvasion, Saint, Saintsbury, Domaine Carneros, Artessa Vineyards and Winery, Truchard, and the Seja Family Vineyards. Um, their downtown Napa tasting room was damaged, but um, it says they're not renewing the lease there anyway. So, not, I mean, not that they're just going to leave it, but as far as any damage there, they're not too concerned, I guess, um, because the lease is up there and not renewing it. And the winery itself had minimal damage to some bottles, glasses, and art. Um, and in the article that I had that, there was someone talking about um, the, the person that's running the winery, uh, the family uh, house is near there, and uh, there was actually more damage at the house than at the winery. So um, interesting. Those And so those are the only wineries that I got any reports saying, Saying that there was um, an issue with um, or, or had any damage. I'm not saying there aren't any in the wineries that, that may have had something, but all the other wineries seemed like they said there was very minimal damage. Um, there was also a report that uh, gentleman with Silver Oak very shortly after the um, quake, and you start seeing these pictures of you know wine on the floor in in, in the winery. You know, the tanks got ruptured or busted, which happened to Hess, by the way. Um, two of their tanks got uh, ruptured, or two of their tanks ruptured, um, and you know barrels on the floor and all this other stuff. So apparently, the owner of uh, Silver Oak uh, was on television early, you know, kind of talking about that there might be a cost problem here. <laughs> okay, so um, there is no evidence that prices are going to go up for Napa Valley Cab or Napa Valley wines uh, in general because uh, they make more than just Cab there. However, if you see a price increase with some of the wineries involved, don't be surprised, okay? But, you know, who knows how many of these people didn't have earthquake insurance or how good the insurance is or how fast they can pay out and they, they've got to pay bills and all that. I mean, it's going to cost a lot of money for, for a lot of these places. And then not just the wineries, okay? I mean, there's other businesses that are impacted. People's homes are impacted. Um, but, you know, since we're kind of talking about wine, um, you know, as far as how fast it takes to get paid out, you know, you got to pay money to to fix all your stuff, uh, to get your winery up and running. There was even a, I read an article, one of the articles I read talked about they're trying to decide whether they're going to go harvest or clean up because they're kind of, some of these places are hard right. now. Um, and the thing about it, the vineyards didn't get hurt. I mean, they're just lines, okay? It's the buildings, all right? Um, and there's, so there's no reports of, like, any of the trellising or anything getting damaged and the vines getting all messed up. Um, so, but uh, besides, you know, the wineries, like I've already mentioned, people see and saw pe pictures of people's houses. Um, of course, there are places of business. Um, so you're going to have, you have a lot of people that are affected by it in the Napa Valley area. It's not just wineries. So um, if, uh, if you're able to buy a few of these bottles, like I decided to, um, I'd say, you know, more power to you. Now, in reality, the bottle of wine I bought today, the winery already got paid for this bottle months ago, probably. Okay. So it's not like I bought today and then all of a sudden, a couple of days later, they're getting their portion of the wine from me. But what it does is depletes the inventory so that the retailer that I bought it from goes up the chain. Oh, I need to order some more Hess or whatever. And then, then the distributor gets some more from the winery and so on, right? So um, what you buy today just means demand. Um, it just means the demand for the wine later on the road happens a little bit sooner, okay? Um, all right, so let's, let's get into some wine here. Now, um, I really hadn't decided which order I was going to do this, and I kind of thought I'd do Cab Franc and then Cabernet Sauvignon. Um, but I got two Cab Francs. 
So I think I'm just going to start with Loire Valley Cab Franc. And the reason is, well, it's France, right? And that's where the grape came from and kind of go down the history of things. So we're going to do this one. Now, uh, the story behind this wine here, this is the 2007 Chateau du Petit Tours. Um, and we'll get a little bit close up on that. And I have a picture of it. Um, how that looks. Oh, hello. Why don't, why don't I just bring it back here a little bit? You can actually see the label better. All right, so um, <laughs> it says... I have a picture of it on my phone. Not that it does me any good right now. But um, so the story behind this wine, so I don't spill on the computer there, um, is that it was given to me by the owner in France. So um, we're going to go through the story real quick. So I went to France a few years ago, uh, 2010? No, 11. 2011. Uh, 2011 went to France and um, I'm on the train and I'm tweeting, I'm in France and blah, 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 and I'm passing through uh, such and such tours, actually. I'm, I'm passing through here in Loire Valley and blah, 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 blah. And I get a tweet from like, the owner saying, hey, or actually the son of the owner, but anyway, the, the guy runs it. Hey, why don't you stop by? I'm like, well, it's kind of hard for me to stop by. I didn't got my luggage. You know, it's, I'm, I'm on the train. It's you know, and, and I, I can't just pop off inside. It was, I think, if I did somehow get off the train there and then they picked me up and took me around, there, I don't think, I can't remember what time the tr next train was that was coming through, but it was pretty late and I was trying to get to Bordeaux. So, anyway, I said, well, I can't do it right now, but I am going back to Paris in a week and, um, you know, maybe, I can, maybe we can hook up then. And uh, the guy said, well, I actually am in Paris a lot have a place there, so let's have dinner. So I uh, get back to Paris and uh, met up with him. Actually, also met up with a, with a couple that we didn't really know existed in France until that year. Um, people were kind of talking through Facebook and blah, blah, blah. And um, so met up with, with uh, the cousin, met up with the people from the, from the uh, winery, and uh, we had some dinner. Uh, me and the people with the winery, we had some dinner at some, I can't remember the name of the restaurant, but we had a dinner there and, uh, they gave me a bottle of this wine and also gave me a bottle of the rosé, which I have previously reviewed. Um, so I've been kind of holding on to this wine cause I was going to review it at some point. And, um, I thought today we'll do it. And, and the big, one of the big reasons why I chose this wine today, one, uh, well, is because when I went to the place to buy the wine, I said, Hey, this is what I'm doing. I need a cat from, from Loire or would prefer one from Loire. Um, and then I'm going to get, and I told him I was pretty much going to get this wine, but you know, one of the wines that were affected from the, uh, from the uh, earthquake. And then after that, it's going to be, you know, whatever. Oh, never mind. Um, so we're going to be like a, whatever for, um, for a cab, cab sauv or cab franc combination and blend. But the point I said was that if either or both grapes are in there, they have to be the majority of the grape. It doesn't have to be like 85% for their designation on a label necessarily, but if there's more than one of the grapes in there, it's got to be the majority grape. So I go, oh, why don't you get this wine? I'm like, I kind of looked at it. I'm like, I don't really think so, but they're the wine shop people, right? So they're going to be experts or hopefully experts in their wines. And it's kind of hard because we got a lot of wines. So I, I get home and I'm pulling it out and I go, okay, let's look up this wine. And it's like 58% Merlot. It is a right bank Bordeaux. Okay. Um, so that should, should not have come as a surprise, but sometimes there's some cab front based wines out of Bordeaux. So anyway, that wine will be used at a different time and we'll review it some other time, whether it's a straight review, if, uh, Merlot Day, I think, is going to be around the time that I'm planning to be in the Napa Valley, Sonoma County area. So I don't know if I'll be doing Merlot Day from there. Doubt it. But um, anyway, so this is what's going on. And uh, um, so that's why I chose this wine because I was like, crap, what do I have? It's already here at the house. And I pull out this wine. I'm like, oh, wait a minute. This is the guy who was looking for, Loire Valley, because this is where it's from, Cap Franc. So I don't have to worry about it. So we're going to have it. So as far as how much it cost me, well, a trip to France. There you go. For the purposes of federal law, 
That is how I acquired the wine. Donation. So this wine's had quite a bit of time to sit in the bottle. Um, obviously, 2009, it's been sitting in the rack for quite a while, kind of just chilling, doing nothing. Um, it's kind of hard to tell on color. Yeah, maybe I should do this more often with the with the laptop. I actually see this, but I mean, color wise, yeah, I know I'm looking down, but I, that's where the laptop is. It's kind of hard to tell on camera. But um, you know, it's not it's not opaque, but it's not see through see through. Yeah, I know. I got the I got the thing here. Last second, I finally decided to put the microphone on. tasty there's a bit of fruit to it too I mean you know there's there's no classic bell pepper that I'm getting right now off of the wine um, I've had the wine open for a little bit but we all know that the first glass isn't always the best taste and that's something to remember as a song that when you're pouring on the wine for somebody, it's not that they're going to necessarily taste all the greatness out of the wine. They're just going to make sure it doesn't, it's not bad wine. Like it's not faulted, it's not corked. With that said, I'm getting a little more pepper to it. Not necessarily piercing, but I'm getting that black pepper and white pepper. Um, feel like I, I get a little bit of wood to it. Um, let's talk about the chateau. So um, they were founded in 1663. Well, it's not there on the webpage, but I know I read it somewhere else. I'm sorry, no. Maybe it's on the back of the label. I swear it was 1600s that they were established. Nope. Not even in the French version of the label does it say uh, the year. However, they've been around for, for quite a while. I know somewhere else when I was looking up the winery, uh, they were founded in the 1600s. Um, anyway, the, they've served in the military. Uh, they, they even fought during the American War of Independence, as they as they put it. Um, so they their their family has been involved um, in French uh, in 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 the army, French army, French military for quite a while. Um, they are located in the Loire Valley uh, near the town of Tours. Um, so kind of the same, you know, difference, just a bit different spelling. Uh, they're located in the vicinity of Borgel, Chinon, and Samir, Samur, near the western border of the Touraine Appalachian. Um, and the vineyard is planted in the saint germain sur on clay and limestone plateau. Um, and uh, anyway, so yeah, so from the Chinon area. Also known under the name, under the name Britain, this... Uh, variety produces thin musk, blue shaded blackberries, ripe grapes. Okay, whatever. Since its rebirth in 1975, the vineyard has grown to 15 hectares. Um, the winemaker is Michael Pinard, who built the well deserved reputation working for more than 10 years with the fabulous Chinon winemaker Charles Jogu. Joguet? Jogu. Joguet. Who is Joguet? No laughing. <laughs> All right. Um, so anyway, I would love to have visited uh, the winery here. Um, I think it would be great to get an interview, a straight-up interview with them in a tour. Um, you know what? If I ever make it back to France, which I'm sure I will at some point in time, um, I'm sure I'll make sure I stop there to, uh, I mean, try to make a stop to, to, to this particular winery in the, in the Loire. But I know that I'm also going to go to Burgundy. So, you know, it's one of those things where unless all of a sudden I'm getting a bunch of uh, um, 
money. Hey, who's, who's there? Hi, viewer. I went back to the thing. Anyway, so Cabernet Franc, good stuff. Now that there's somebody watching, maybe if you put the chat on, maybe I can send you a link and you can join. Well, how about hi, not who? Um, now, that is going to be one thing I don't know how to, once, I, once I've got somebody watching, how to get them to join. A little bit of smokiness. A little bit of smoke onto it. Oh, yeah. Do, do. What are we drinking? How about that? Here you go, lower third. <laughs> Approximately $15 retail. Like I said, I didn't buy this wine. And it's pretty good. I mean, you're gonna want to, you're gonna want to have this paired with some savory stuff. Um, might even work with the pizza I had earlier. I only had one slice. I got another slice still back there. Just didn't have time to finish it and get this ready. Um, but a little bit of savoriness to it. Um, definitely something that if you can find this in in the states, I would say check it out. I mean, it's a fifteen dollar bottle of wine. About you might get it for a little less. It might be a little more. Um, People are cool. Let's put it that way. Hey, they they came they they met me in Paris and bought me dinner. I mean, how cool is that? But if you can find if you can find this one, you should check it out. All right, viewers, how many of you saw or read the? Um, thing with the uh, uh, competition, the Texas Best Sommelier competition. Didn't read it? Go read it real quick. I'll, I'll, I'll be here. Okay. Don't go read it. Well, go read it, but not right now. So one of the things I did not have, and we're not supposed to talk about the details of, of the competition or even the exam, but I'll tell you that this is essentially the advanced exam. All right? So... What I will tell you is I highly suggest if you're going to be in the advanced exam or the competition is that you make sure you bring all of the tools required for service. One of those tools is so that you can do proper decanting, whether it's, well, decanting for sediment more than just decanting just to decant. So what do you want? What do you need? Well, you need one of these. Well, not this specifically, but a lighter. So I got all mad I didn't have a lighter on me because I needed it for the candle. So I bought one. Um, it's kind of cool. There we go. I got my logo on there. This is Zippo. Yeah, that went a little overboard on it, but now I have a cool lighter. All right, so we're here to drink wine, right? So let's go to the next one. I think, I think what we're going to do is we're going to do the next wine here. It will be the Calcareous uh, Cabernet Franc. This is 2007, as the uh, lower third says. Getting fancy here. Yeah. Poured a little too much for the rinse. Doing. So, Calcarius, they are from Paso Robles in California. Um, never heard of them until today. This is one of the wines that was suggested by uh, the gentleman over at Specs. Uh, purchase it for twenty eight thirty nine. Was it after my discount? Yeah, I think that was after. This is like the cash slash debit card, five uh, percent discount. So it's probably like twenty nine something, almost thirty dollars. So, um, so Calcareous Vineyards. Uh, let's let's pull them up real quick here. And um, so they're out of uh, Paso Robles, and. Um, They've got quite a few different wines that they do, and uh, father and daughter, daughter, father and daughter, 
Sorry. Lloyd Nesser and Dana Brown realized your dream of finding a place to express your passion for one in 2000 when they established Calcareous Vineyards on one of the highest limestone uh, plateaus in Paso Robles' west side. Hence the name. All right. Um, they both, uh, they're both experienced, both Lloyd and Dana, experienced wine distributors in their native Iowa. Oh, interesting. Recognized that the west side of Paso Robles had potential to produce world-class wines. They acquired 342 acres. Uh, they're 1,800 feet above sea level. And uh, they're dedicated to highest quality terroir-driven wines possible. And uh, for over a decade, they've produced uh, blends and varietals that they uh, say exhibit Paso Robles claim to being distinct, different, being distinct and different. Uh, Lloyd passed away in 2006. Dana advances her their vision with the help of her sister, Erica. All right. They are 12 miles from the Pacific Ocean, and they say they enjoy the full benefits of the Paso Robles' unique west side climate. The western edge of Paso Robles' AVA is probably the fastest growing, most, most sought-out land for growing wine grapes in California. Um they, uh, they have regulating maritime influences of both the Templeton Gap and the Salinas Valley Fogs, and steep hillside topo topography created a spectacular climate for growing wine grapes. Long, warm days during the growing season, followed by cool nights. So, um, and, and the reason you want that, and, and I'm not the only place that has this, uh, the reason you want this, what they call dineural uh, uh, temperature swing, and you want a big one, is that... If everything stays warm, even at night, then the grapes don't have time to cool down, rest, literally, and uh, get their acid levels put up. So they're just constantly producing sugar. So you need um, you need to be able to have a good balance between uh, hot and cold for throughout the day during the growing season. So that the wines during the day they're they're getting all the sugar built up, and then at the end, then at night they're cooling down, they're resting, and then the acid starts building. And then we have that balance of sugar and acid. That's when you that's when you harvest. All right, so let's check it out. I meant to look up the actual wine because I definitely there's definitely some uh, oak treatment to this. Do do. Well, wouldn't you know it? Uh, let me tell you, when you have wine out on the um, out in the retail, and you don't have it on your website, that's really yeah. Let's see if there's anything under the trade list. You never know. Yeah, I'm not seeing it. Well, we'll just taste it and we'll just go through it. The website's kind of nice. They just don't have this wine on there. Kind of like another wine we're about to have that they didn't put a certain wine on their website. Not the wine we're having today, just a different wine. So definitely wood treatment. Um, you know, you get this creaminess, this vanilla uh, aromas. So you know, I don't want to say chemical, but there's definitely like another. Another aroma there that's not unpleasant, just not, not expected. Darker red fruits, like a, like blackberry. As far as any floral, don't really get anything like that. Thank you. 
pretty tannic. Um, really coats the gums. Um, if I didn't know any better, I probably would call this Cabernet Sauvignon. Does say Cabernet Franc on the bottle? Okay, it's making sure you know I wasn't tricked. But if if I was just drinking this wine, just blindly, someone just poured me this glass, this wine, and said, "Hey, try this wine. It's awesome." I'd be like, "Tastes like a Cabernet Sauvignon." I mean, literally, I don't think I could pick this out as a Cabernet Franc. Um, maybe that's because I don't drink a lot of American Cabernet Francs. When I drink Cab Franc, it's usually from France. Um, usually from Chinon or Loire Valley, or it's part of a mixture of other things. So their Cab Franc characteristics might be coming through. But as far as a 100% varietal uh, American Cabernet Franc, I almost never drink that. Um, there's another one by Cost, Cost, Costanto. I want to say Costantino, but that's not it. Um, it's called the Franc. And I had that in a blind tasting, and I, I called, I think, Cabernet Sauvignon. And it's like, yeah, it's kind of tricky. I think it's a really good one. If you find it and you see it, get it. But but one of the things that I, that would might lead me to believe it's not a cab, the color, at least what little wine is in the glass right now. Well, color-wise, I don't really see anything significantly different than I would guess at a cab. I have a Cabernet Sauvignon. It is a good wine. No, no doubt about it. It's really tasty. I mean, I would say I would say I probably would not be able to tell the difference between this and the Cabernet Sauvignon. No difference at all. But it's really tasty. So if you find it out there um, in the store, which I'm sure you can, um, it's tasty. It's kind of good. Uh, it's got the it's got the same characteristics. I mean, it's just got darker fruits. It's got a little bit of vanilla. Um, it's a little bit of creaminess to it. It's good on tannins. Uh, acid is probably medium. I'd say on, on the tannin. Um, it's kind of juicy. It's very fruit forward. Um, all the kinds of stuff that you expect from a California wine. And especially at the level that we're talking about. So this wine is not cheap. It's not you know, some $10 or $5 bottle of wine. It's not two buck chuck. But I mean, it is in that higher 20 to $40 range, and it drinks about where it should be. Yeah, I think it's um, I think it's a pretty good wine. If you have a chance to find it, I would definitely recommend it. Absolutely recommend it if you can find it. Okay, so on to wine number three. So we are doing the S. Alamy, not into the spit bucket, Mark. Have you ever drank the spit bucket? Don't. Just don't. Before we get on to this ice bucket challenge, I have been challenged, and I haven't decided if I'm going to. I'm probably going to do it, but um, and but I had thought about doing something really crazy, and doing it kind of after the show, pouring the spit bucket on me. I mean, if you're a wine guy, why are you pouring ice, ice water on you? There's my idea. If somebody else wants to do it, go right ahead. Um, anyway, the, the ice bucket challenge that I've been challenged by Ceci Barreto, who, if you're a longtime viewer of the show, now that she's on the show a few times, and she's a good friend of mine here in San Antonio. Um, 
she she decided instead of dumping water on her, which I like that idea very much, to drink some ice wine. So there you go. There's another wine connection. So it's and it's also less messy than dumping a wine bucket over your head. So um, anyway, <laughs> um, she she challenged quite a few people a couple of days ago. Uh, I don't have any ice wine at the house. I, I, I had thought about buying some today, but honestly, I just kind of forgot. Um, it's like I forgot to get the milk and the bread today, too. <laughs> but um, anyway, um, so if you want to do the challenge, you know, more, f feel free to it. Um, it's just that in my, in my view, if you're going to donate, just donate. There isn't necessarily a need to challenge somebody to do something crazy. Um, and not that you have to call somebody out to donate because then they feel like bad if they don't and you should be able to choose the char charities that you want to donate to. So anyway, there's my little bit about the uh, challenge. I don't think it's necessarily anything wrong. I just think sometimes things are a little bit farther along than people expect it. So the Hess Alami, let's get off of that. Hess Alami, uh, Alomi, Alami, uh, Cabernet Sauvignon. So the Hess uh, winery is in Mount Veter, uh, Napa Valley. This is about off the top of my head, around three, four, maybe five miles northwest of American Canyon, uh, where the epicenter was. Um, and they were um, they were hit pretty decently. They have uh, two, uh, their tanks were ruptured, so they lost however many gallons of wine that is, um, which is pretty, you know, a large amount of wine in those things. Um, so they're definitely a winery that I say, if you're going to try to support wineries through financial means, buy up their wines so that they can sell more wines down the road. Um, but let's talk about Hess. Now, I have reviewed one of their wines before. Even though it's not on their website, I reviewed, I'm sorry, I reviewed the Tucson Chardonnay um, back in episode 297, and it was posted April of this year. And uh, it was um, one of those wines where I just, one of those episodes where I just did just the one wine. So just to get wines just to get 100 reviews done and uh, not have to spend a ton of money um but anyway uh, i was part of the hess collection and i did mention in the review and on the link um that there was no uh mention of it on the wine on the website for their wine so not sure why but my speculation was it was meant to be a grocery store wine and not really a wine you could buy through the winery they probably, they probably didn't even have it um at the winery for the t for tasting so it might have been just something that they just they, – they produced. They had extra juice. Who knows? But it's kind of hard to tell when there's no information on it. So where did this come from? So the Hess collection uh, is what it's called. Uh, Donald Hess uh, was born in Switzerland, and um, he eventually made his way over to the United States um, and uh, – Said with a passion of, for with a passion for premium wine grown regions, uh, Donald sought after Donald sought after and personally developed the Hess Collection Winery in the Maya Camus Mountain Range on the slopes of Mount Veter, um, and Bodega Colome Winery in Salta Province, Argentina. So he's got a couple interests around the world. Um, he has. Uh, so to further complement his vision of diversity, excellence, and fine wines, the Hess Group has grown to include Peter Lehman of uh, Barossa, Australia, and Glen Carlu Winery in Parle, South Africa, both second-generation family-run wineries. Um, he's also He was trained as a ninth-generation brewmaster, so he also assumes the responsibility for the family's brewery and hotel businesses uh, in his early 20s. Um, from the beginning, his philosophical concept for new business development was to deal only in natural products. The cornerstone business was the Valser, was Valser Mineral Water, one of the most successful brands in Switzerland, which I already went through all this in episode 297, but I figured I'd kind of go over it again in case you didn't know where they came from. So he's been around for a while. Um, he became interested in, wine, in mountain wine growing during a business trip to Napa in the 70s. Uh, and his research took him to Mount Veter, where he found mountain vineyards with ideal combination of soils and microclimates that yielded wine grapes of distinctive character. In 78, he purchased 900 acres of established vines, um, and he did not release any wines until 1987. Um, 
So that's great when you can do that because now, now you're not just you're not producing wine just to produce it um, because it's, it takes time. If for as far as new vines, it takes time to uh, to actually get any quality wine out of it. Um, but even then, these were established vines. So I mean, these this is something where he wasn't. Uh, now he just didn't release the eighty-seven. Doesn't mean it was nineteen eighty-seven vintage. So he might have released say an eighty-five or an eighty-four vintage. But you know, hey, uh, if you have the ability to do it, then do it. Uh, he's also an art collector. Uh, he attracted the attention of Art News in 1981, where he was ranked one of the top 200 art collectors in the world. And uh, they have they have their art collection uh, displayed in their Napa Valley, South Africa, and Argentina uh, wineries. So um, he's got quite a quite a bit going on there. Uh, the winery also is uh, dedicated to. Uh, Effectively trying to be very natural in their winemaking, on uh, their farming. Um, I won't go through the entire website page on this, but um, they are very committed to um, uh, being um, as natural as they can. Um, they do composting. They have cover crops. Um, they have, let's see the beneficial insects and owls. So obviously they use wildlife to help them. Um, he sits on the uh, the president sits on the board of directors for the wine institute and is involved in their development of the code of sustainable wine growing practices. So, um, you know, as far as sustainability and natural and bio, uh, I don't see biodynamic necessarily anywhere here, but my impression is from reading everything that they are trying to be as um, natural as they can. Um, no, that hasn't come up yet. We've already talked about this. See, the Hess Collection Winery is among the first wineries to receive certification for the California Sustainable Wine and Growing Alliance by third party certification. Well, if you sit on the board, it's not hard to get that, right? But if you're not part of it, how? why would you sit on the board? So I'm not saying that that's the only reason why. I right, let's get into the wine. So this is the 2011 vintage. I do have that lower third up, just making sure. So I'm looking at the website stuff, so. Um, they say that the 2000, they said 2011 was uh, being called unusual is an understatement, challenging perhaps, limiting, only in a sense. Uh, consistent rains fell throughout the winter months and into spring and into June. It cool weather led to a late harvest and then unexpected fall rains. In the end, it was a winemaker's vintage where skills and experience gained over many seasons of farming are put to the test. Okay. Um, lower yields resulted in the resulting winds trend toward low wines, I almost said winds, uh, toward lower alcohol and deft tannins. The vintage offers fruit that in the right hand, such as those among the winemaking and vineyard teams that has collection, blah, 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 results in wines with admirable structure and balance. All right, so let's just get into the wine. Anybody looking to join on camera here? No, not screen share. Chat. No, no, we're not doing that. Do you have the chat on? Here, let's let's get a new let's get a little little new uh, pour into here. Funky. I mean, I really think there's some sulfur type of. I really think there's a little bit of SO2 in this. We'll see. Hmm. 
you know, it's kind of plummy. So where do I expect plum to come from? Merlot. Not cab. Not that you can't have any plumminess in it. There is zero Merlot in it. 85% Cabernet Sauvignon, 13% 13% Petit Syrah, and 2% Petit Verdot Verdot. 18 months in American oak, 25% of which is new. One thing I want to talk about is that the vineyard, the Alamy Vineyard, is in the northern part of, um, of Napa Valley rather than on Mount Veter. Um, and it looks like it's near Hal Mountain. Well, near, Hal, not in Hal Mountain. It was just on the map that says near Hal Mountain, near St. Helena, but so in the northern part. A bit woodsy. I feel like I'm kind of getting the actual wood flavor um, combined with this plumminess, um, darker fruits now, really getting kind of that that blackberry type of fruit. Um, maybe a hint of black pepper. Um, it's it's a pretty decent wine. I'm gonna say honestly, the 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 uh, calcareous is so far my favorite wine of the three um you know it's supposed to be a cab franc i didn't think it was um this is a good wine too and it's also well this is the middle the middle price point of the three wines so uh it's pretty good this is definitely not a, a restaurant wine or restaurant list wine you'll find out there if you're going to have it with steak uh, it's going to go well with steak it's going to pair well with it um it's going to pair it'll pair well with pot roast because there's definitely some uh, some body to it. Um, definitely some. Ooh, I just all I just all of a sudden got like this tobacco in the back end of my mouth. Um, tobacco and like this fleshiness. So I mean, it's really there's really some complexity coming on that I didn't initially get. Yeah. Really getting to the tobacco now. It's pretty decent. I mean, I can. Oh, I guess I shouldn't just sit back too much. I won't get illuminated. <laughs> anyway, Woo, watch out! I'm going to blind people with that bald spot there. Um, yeah, it's pretty decent wine. Um, tannins are, are, I'd say, medium plus. It can really kind of coats the mouth here. Um, you find this easy to find this wine out there on uh, in, in retail land, and you'll probably find it in quite a few uh, wine lists. Um, you know, I bought it for 20 something dollars. Um, you probably will spend somewhere between 70 and a hundred dollars on a wine list, depending on how much the, how much the, um, restaurant paid for it and what their markup is on it. <laughs> mm. I'm getting more pepper, more pepper out of it, pepperiness. I'm really starting to like this wine a lot. Um, allowing it to develop in the glass, develop over time. We definitely need some food for this wine. This is not a quaffing wine. None of these wines are wines that you just kind of sit back and just quaff. You're just, you really should have some food with it. I mean, I'd say the 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 tours one is probably the lightest of the three so if you wanted to just kind of sit back and enjoy some wine you could but these other two your your best bet is 
to get some food with it, whether you're getting some meats or cheeses, um, some really good stuff like that. Got some more viewers here. All right, so, um, well, I've done all the wines already. Now, you, you all that are viewing, you've got to help me out here. There's got to be a way, if you want to join in off your webcam or whatever, there's got to be a way that you can join in on the conversation. Because I'd love to, just to kind of have some people pop in, hang out. I um, mean, it is called a hangout, right? But for the life of me, I really don't know how to do that. So, do any of you know how to get me to invite you on what's going on? If you do, give me a little shout out. But for right now, I'm going to have a little fun. Oof, oof. It actually works pretty well. I'm impressed. All right. Remove all effects. Remove all effects. There we go. Uh, join. How about that? So let's see if there is... Invite people. What is this? A quiet invitation. So, I don't know. Um, if you want to join, you're going to have to send me your Google, you're going to have to send me your Google uh, profile name so that I can actually send you an actual invite. I think that's the only way to do it. So, um, wines. Well, you know what? Why don't we do this? Why don't we revisit some of these wines? I just say I'm pretty impressed with how uh, this looks. And um, I'm very pleased with with the look of it. Uh, it looks like the audio is coming out pretty good. I'll I'll, tell, I'll be able to tell when I get onto YouTube a little bit later today once everything is processed um, to see how this uh, how this looks. But um, technology wise, I'm very happy with how everything is proceeding. So what are we doing right now? So we just poured. We just poured the Chateau du Petit Tours. So if you're just joining, which there are some people definitely joining, welcome to Cabernet Day. Um, as I said, I would like for other people to be able to join in on this. And, um, I mean, I've already started the, the whole deal. There should be ways for me to invite people. But send me, a, send me a thing in the chat room. If you follow me on Twitter, you can also send me a tweet a mention on 1337 wine so we're revisiting the Chateau du Petit Tours been doing this for a little over an hour so far I guess the Apple TV finally turned off on its own. So this whole thing, before this setup, I had the Apple TV going, playing some music, and then the screensaver is this random flicker um, 
image assessment's been going on this whole time in the background on the TV. And it just finally, I guess Apple said, hey, man, you're not playing any music. So, so it turned off. Definitely a, a lighter wine, um, not heavy, not as heavy on the tannins as the Hess or the Calcareous. Let's get that back into the screenshot. Um, I'm gonna take the lower third off too. Then you can actually see the Hess. Um, you know, definitely a lighter wine. Definitely not a fruit forward wine. You're, you, you get more of the wood from it, a little more minerality to it. I would never confuse this for a California cab or franc or whatever. Um, would definitely, almost definitely put this in the old world school of winemaking. No, not yeah. Like I said, not a lot of fruit to 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 really hit you. It's a thinner wine, you know, lower or or, or lighter wine. Like I said, this is the one wine that if I was just going to sit back and uh, if I was going to sit back and just chill, want to drink a little bit of wine while watching some Vikings football, then um, you know, this would be probably of the three wines. This would be probably the wine that I would. I would do that with um, rather than the other two. Um, really subdued, really, you know, not a whole lot going on um, with it. But, uh, you know, overall, a pretty decent wine. And like I said, it's around the $15 range. Um, it was a gift by uh, the, uh, the people running the winery. It was not, um, it was not a, uh, I didn't purchase it. Okay, for the purposes of federal law. Um, I already established that early on. Did, did you know that bloggers have to explain by federal law where they got their products if they review it? Because you had a group of bloggers that would blog about products, and it was actually paid advertising. It was actually the, the – the, in this case, we'll just say the winery would have written the post instead of the blogger. But usually it was about other products. So there's a law now that says you have to, in, in the blog post itself, you have to say somehow, some way, or have some type of thing in your website how you acquire the products that you, you review or comment on. I don't care. I think with something like wine, you kind of need to talk about where you got it from. All right. Um, let's go back to the calcareous. Let's see if it still remains my favorite of the three. By the way, uh, Minnesota is winning at halftime. 16 to nothing. And not that preseason really matters. And especially fourth week of the preseason, it's all the, it's all the guys trying to make the last spot on the team. So... You know, again, uh, I'm, I'm back to it. I'm che checking it out. Just had you know the other cab so Cabernet Sauvignon. Had the other Cabernet Franc. I'm back to this Cab Franc. If I was doing deductive tasting, for sure I would be like California Cab. I wouldn't necessarily say Paso Robles, but I would definitely think it was Cabernet Sauvignon. 100% be convinced it was. If, if it wasn't, I would say it's Merlot. So only thing that concerns me about it, I mean, it's a close to $30 bottle of wine. It's good. It's the best of the three wines. And if you're, you've got the scratch to pay 30 bucks for a bottle of wine, which, you know, I'm not gonna say it's uber expensive, but it's also not like reasonably, it's not like value wine. Definitely get it. But I just think that there's 
if it's you know maybe maybe it's Cap Franc and Cabernet Sauvignon, and it's like right at that that point, it's you know eighty five and fifteen or something like that. But it's good. It's tasty. This be at twenty eight thirty nine at Specs. If you're in the Texas market, um, Specs has been expanding quite a bit in Texas. Um, I'm sure it's going to be around the same amount of money at Total Wine or Bev Bevmo or Binnie's up in Chicago and wherever 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 you can buy fine wine, are probably around the same price, around twenty eight twenty five to thirty dollars. I like it. I like it a lot. All right, we'll go back to the Hess. Again, if you're just joining, Hess was one of the wineries that was very much affected by the quake in Napa on Sunday and uh, on the 24th. So um, if you're interested in trying to support wineries that had issues, now again, just remember, you buy the wine today, that money is just going to the retailer, okay? Because the retailer already paid the distributor and the distributor already paid the winery. So Hess already has the money for this bottle of wine. But buying the wine means that you're depleting inventory, which means you're gonna order more wine, which you know, go back to the distribution chain, should eventually mean the winery has to sell more wine, either current release or if they've already sold all the current release, they just know that whatever's new coming up they're they're already gonna have people looking for it, so or just go directly to the wine to the winery and buy it. I see again. I didn't really mention this. Well, yeah, I kind of did. There's definitely a smokiness, you know. Definitely a smoke bomb aroma to it. And even a little bit on, on the palate. If that's a turnoff for you, then, then be be aware that, at least on this bigger bottle, there's a little bit of that smoke bomb to it. But it's also very juicy. It's very fruity. Um, good tannins. Actually, it feels like the tannins is a little bit higher than when I first tried it. It's definitely... It's kind of funny. The calcareous, I would almost say is classic California cab but this is also California cab and I would be able to mis I don't think I would mistake it for anything else um, whether I'd say it was Napa Valley I don't know but definitely would not mistake it for anything other than California cab it's a good one well unless somebody can actually figure out how to join me and start talking and, and be on video. Um, I think I'm going to wrap this up. I've um, been doing this for just over an hour. So um, I really appreciate uh, everybody just stopping by all, already. Um, if you caught this late, then uh, it will be up on YouTube here at some point in time later tonight. Um, I will pull that file down. I'll put the uh, little editing into it, put a little, couple breaks maybe here, there, whatever. Um, and uh, uh, put it up on the website. So now, and uh, it'll be up on TiVo. It'll be up on uh, uh, your Roku box through iWine.tv, the iFood.tv app. Uh, they, these guys have been great for me. Um, TiVo, my viewership numbers have not quite recovered from where they were before. Um, back when the whole iTunes debacle happened and I told TiVo about it and TiVo like went, oh, we're gonna, okay, we'll stop the feed. I'm like, no, no, don't stop the feed. And they already had. Um, and uh, so, but I got everything working. Now, I'm not going go through the details, just know that the, that the videos are back on iTunes um, and they're back on TiVo. So those viewership numbers have really, uh, 
come almost 100% back to where they were. So I'm really excited about that. Of course, through blip, the numbers are, are doing fine. Actually, in some ways, I think the blip numbers are even increasing a little bit um, on just what blip does. So that's good. So the wine show is, is growing. I really appreciate it. We're at 300, and this is episode 309. Um, pretty amazing. Um, I'll record a few more. This, this actual episode will be up on Labor Day once I download it and edit it. And, um, hey, man, you hung out with me for a little bit, the, the few viewers that, that showed up. I mean, I didn't have a lot of – it was just kind of all last minute, so I didn't have a lot of people that, that actually said yes in the, to begin with. Um, had a couple people that actually were like, man, I wish I could join you, but I had this, that, and the other going on. And that's cool, man. Um, you know, just you got there's things that if I had something else going on, I wouldn't be doing this either. Um, but I appreciate all of you that decided to stop by, and um, that's going to do it. As far as the viewers who didn't do this live, again, as always, thank you for stopping by. Click the links below. I'll have links for the uh, for the wineries, and um, hit hit me up here, friend me up here above, then on the site, and uh, hit the donate button over here, and uh, we'll see everyone again next time.